A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Directors Club webinar, a series of knowledge share um, online events uh, brought to you in association today with Verint. The subject of today's uh, webinar, the title is The Science of Complaints Management, Reducing Compliance Risk in, a, in, in Regulated Industries. My name is John Snow and I'm the current chair of the Directors Club and I will be, I will be your host and your master of ceremonies for, for today's webinar. And uh, I'll be also hosting our Q&A at the end of the formal session today. Now, the topic that we are concentrating on is uh, all to do with customer complaint detection, an early warning system for compliance risk. And we've got two special guest speakers today. Um, both of them are from, from Verint, and Verint are one of the leading innovators in the area of, uh, of customer complaint management with, with, with particular focus. On, uh, on compliance risk, and today we're we're concentrating on 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 that on that within uh, within the context of uh, of of regulated industry. So we've got Claire Richardson. Claire is the VP of WFO Solutions uh, for the EMEA region for Verint, and Mikhail Laley, who's uh, a director also within WFO um, EMEA um, for Verint. Now, during today's uh, presentation, you can ask questions at any time. Um, we're going to be having a formal Q&A session after the presentations, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, that Q&A will call upon um, your, your questions, and uh, as I say, you can submit those at any point. You don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. Um, you, you can just click on that uh, Q&A icon, which is on the floating toolbar, which I think will be on the right of your screen, and it's the little question mark. You click on that, and your Q&A window will open, and, uh, and if you type your, uh, your question into the smaller um, window on, on, on that Q&A control panel, and uh, you can use up to 256 characters, so it can be a very simple question, or it can be relatively complex. That will come through to us here, and uh, we'll try and address as many of your questions during that live Q&A session. But if we don't manage to, uh, to cover all of them, I will be forwarding your questions to the appropriate speakers uh, today, and, uh, and, um, and they will be uh, responding to you directly if we don't get to cover those off um, within the live Q&A. Now, you can tweet our, our webinar today. Um, you can tell people, you can tell your followers all about what's happening by using the hashtag DCGBNI. Now, if you're not a follower of our Twitter feed here at the Directors Club, we very much encourage you to become a follower because we do a, uh, we do a, a, a curation of the internet with regards to customer-focused stories. So stories, feature articles, opinion pieces, the latest research in customer service, customer experience, uh, customer management, contact centers. We cover all of those and, uh, and we put those on our Twitter feed, which is at DCGBNI. So you can tweet about today's event using that hashtag. And if you're not a follower, post the event. Why don't you become a follower at DCGBNI? But on with the show, and I would like to introduce uh, to you our, our two special guests today, um, Claire, Claire Richardson, um, who will be um, speaking second. But uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Mikhail Laley. And uh, let me just unmute you, Mikhail, and uh, welcome you. Um, ho hope you can hear me and ho hope you're doing well today. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, to, to talk about complaints, and um, I would like to sort of set the scene and talk first about, about complaints itself. And, and things, things are changing, as I'm sure you're well aware, and we see that every day in our businesses. Um, I mean, the, the consumer has never been as empowered as they are today. And whereas you know, in the past, and one could argue how far in the past, I guess that depends on the industry, but they, they couldn't complain easily. And besides that, even if they could, changing suppliers has, has been uh, difficult, um, 
And in many cases, those difficulties, those barriers have been broken down through uh, consumer pressure, through the uh, authorities, through these bodies that are protecting the consumer. And it is not as it was and it, will never, it never will be again. And, and we see that as recently now as, you know, in financial services where, you know, the migration from going from one bank to another has been broken down and, you know, it has to be achieved within a week and it has to be facilitated, etc. So gradually we see across industries that, you know, one, consumers are more assertive but then it's also being made much easier to, one, complain and take action on those complaints, on that dissatisfaction. And so on the one hand, as an organization, we, we need better visibility of those complaints and the technology is there today to provide that visibility. Um, and of course, there's also the financial risk um, from badly handling complaints either from the consumers and increased attrition through ba badly handling those, um, but then also from those governing bodies that, that could um, put fines on individual organizations uh, because of the way they handle uh, these complaints. And the thing is, oh, apologies, sorry. The thing is, you know, Consumers, when we look at research that Varen's done um, with Ipsos Mori, and we see that consumers, and sorry, the, uh, the CCA Ipsos Mori Varen survey that I've referenced at the bottom of the uh, slide, um, we see that consumers still think that companies don't care, or a large part of them. And as a result, you know, even that providing feedback is, is not very, very useful. I mean, it, it wouldn't change anything. But if we look at what companies think, what organizations think in general, is that they do have a process for handling complaints. And so they are dealing with the issues. And this disconnect, unfortunately, the organizations are not in control of the conversation, right? Um, it's the consumer that can take their business elsewhere. And, and, and that, is, that is showing. So we need to make sure we close that gap. And, and we need to think about consumers and their complaints in a different way. I mean, complaints are a good thing. I mean, there was a, a story about a bank, I think it was in Finland, um, where they, they closed their branch, it was all online, um, was all self-service, and at one point they found out they, they've totally disconnected from the consumer and they no longer had any interaction with them. Um, and complaints is, is a good way, and solving a complaint positively is an opportunity to increase their, their, their uh, satisfaction and increase that, uh, build that experience and build loyalty. But everybody in the organization needs to co-own that customer, that relationship, and therefore also that complaint. Uh, too often, it is a focal point of the front office um, and the back office is sort of the one who actually deals with that uh, to, to some extent. Um, and unfortunately, when we look at the metrics, they're all designed to have many of those complaints fall through the cracks. When we say, you know, we have a 90% first call resolution or we have uh, an 85% an SLA and things like that, and we see then automatically what that means is that uh, 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 too large a, a part of those complaints will just fall through the cracks, they will go nowhere. Uh, and then separately, of course, externally we have regulations, we have these governing bodies that, that look over our shoulder and that are driving, that are pushing us to, to change um, with those changing expectations and those changing behaviors. And we see that, you know, it's everybody's seen these high profile cases, whether it's the US, where we've seen very big financial services organizations um, that, that have been fined. Uh, we see the same patterns in the UK. And the thing is, when we look at the US, in some cases, they are ahead in terms of where we're going, with it, where this is changing us. Um, and in the US, we see much more personal. Um, uh, personal fault being at at the at, at senior management being put at senior management, and we see, for example, when we see at the, look at the Dodd Frank Act, which is driving 
uh, trading to provide like full trade reconstruction, providing visibility on demand of each individual sale. And I'm sure, you know, as technology continues to mature, um, we'll see the same thing here. I mean, why wouldn't we, with all the, the PPI and other mis-selling cases that are being raised, why wouldn't um, the government body, governing bodies at some point demand that we provide full visibility and we have a mature audit trail? So, when we look at these different cases and the fact that it's also so much easier to raise complaints, if we look at you know, the FCA website and we look at other bodies like the financial ombudsman and such, it is so easy to raise a complaint. It's so easy to, you know, whatever channel, whether it's by email, by, by mail, by, by, you know, whatever reason it is. And, and you see that. You see when we look at the patterns with, for example, with some of our customers, with some of these bodies, um, and we see their workload, I mean, the number of complaints is just rising exponentially and they continue to rise it's, it's unbelievable um, when you look at the backlog that they have in terms of dealing with those, uh, with those complaints. And you see that around PPI as well, in terms of financial services, they don't have the bandwidth to deal with those complaints, and as a result, it changes their behavior. Uh, in some cases, not even fully reviewing those complaints, just settling them. And when we look um, at at the trend, so the trend is going up, and our ability to, to detect and to uh, look ahead towards these complaints and, and be much more um, forward-facing, um, I mean, that's sort of running behind. But the regulator's review is, is sort of pushing ahead and pushing the industries ahead to ensure that we deal with those, with those correctly. And I think the intrusion and the, the way they will look over our shoulders to ensure that we address that correctly, I mean, that will continue to uh, mature and, and change as well. They will demand higher levels of visibility. I mean, some of the things they look at, are obviously, I mean, they're not necessarily uh, looking at individual consumer cases, but those are indicators. Um, so where they look at, you know, how, how they're impacted, uh, are these issues avoidable? Um, are there system issues behind this? Is there a structural issue uh, that is driving these problems? When, when I look, when I visit uh, uh, our customers and when I look at how they deal with these complaints, um, I'm struck by the limited visibility that exists, um, not only about the fact that those complaints were raised, but also about understanding what the drivers are between, uh, behind those, those complaints and what the status is of the complaints handling. Um, I mean, if you look at financial services where there's an eight-week uh, um, uh, timeline, an eight-week eight uh, deadline for handling a complaint, and what I see that you know, in week six, the majority of those complaints hasn't even been reviewed yet. Um, so, so what is behind that? Is it, is it process? Is it technology? Is it something else? I mean, I was at a, uh, an organization not too long ago where they actually believed that it was the consumer's problem. It was their fault because they didn't understand the process. Um, well, that's one way of looking at it. Um, fortunately, they are in a monopoly. Um, but when we look at those indicators, right, uh, when we look at those individual customers, when we look at what the regulators are looking at those same things we could be looking at as an organization, as a business. There are ways to early indicators to understand where there is a breakdown in the process, where <clears throat> we're misaligned in terms of the expectations. Um, and, and looking at traffic, looking at those different drivers. Um, I was in a real time, so an intraday service center and we saw the traffic go up by 5%. Uh, it took us three days to realize what the actual drivers are were behind that 5% increase in workload. That, that, is, that is no longer necessary. That's based on you know, yesterday's technology and yesterday's processes. We, we don't need to be there. We can have instant visibility in what those drivers are. So, so that leads us to, sorry, I forgot to forward. Um, 
uh, I, I do apologize, but um, you, you'll receive a copy of the uh, of the presentation. Um, it's it's uh, that leads us to to how how do you handle those complaints? And with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Claire. Thank you, Michiel. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So let, let's have a little think about how we actually go about handling complaints within a business. And I look at this with, with, with my team quite, quite regularly around trying to break down the process with our customers um, to get that, that better insight and to understand the roles of different individuals within a business. So understanding um, the role of a supervisor versus the role of, say, a quality assurance um, individual. So um, really working, you know, the supervisor to me is there as, as, that, as that coach and mentor for their teams um, to support through, through a process. And if we're seeing that there is a lot of complaints arising with it within a certain team, how do, how do we handle that? And how do we, we ensure that we're, ha we're um, responding to those complaints if it's over the phone in, in, in a very positive and effective manner? So certainly the supervisor is, is, is looking at how many times um, you know, identifying the, com the complaints within their team and understanding the process that they should be followed um, <clears throat> within the team. So looking at it as a, as a discussion between an employee, an advisor and a customer, um, if the customer is unhappy, then asking the customer to provide that feedback. And, and quite often, you know, when I, when I sit, go into a business and I sit down with some of the employees, which I absolutely love doing, and talking around processes, very often the employees, we talk it through and the employee says to me, they said, yeah, but the customers are, are, are giving me, uh, are complaining about something that is completely outside of my control. Um, and it may be outside of their control, but we look at it from what, but how have you interacted around that? Have you dealt with that inquiry? And have, has, has the customer gone away feeling that their, their issue has been resolved or some ownership has been taken for that? So we look at it from a couple of areas. Was the employee helpful? Hopefully they were helpful. And were they able to resolve the, the, the complaint or the situation to the customer's satisfaction as well as to the business's satisfaction? If we have an answer of no to either of those, um, we then look at it in, in two areas. Was it within their control or was it outside of their control? And if it was within their control, that's really, to me, where the supervisor steps in and does their job as that mentor and their coach. And they review the comments and if the customer is given formal feedback through a survey, they review those comments and they work on a training enablement coaching plan with the employee so that in future the same situation arises, we avoid, we avoid repeating mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, but we want to learn from them to drive, drive the right behavior. So it takes that supervisor from just sitting there and listening into calls and, and maybe giving a couple of a bit of guidance to really being in a hands-on mentoring role. In a lot of instances, um, the, the um, complaint is outside of the employee's control. And, you know, sitting down talking to, to employees, they quite often have the solutions to a lot of problems within businesses because they hear the same situation again and again and it's really quite insightful having those conversations. But it's, actually, it's how do you communicate back to somewhere within the business that there is, there is an issue arising and we're getting complaints from it but I can't deal, I can't resolve the complaint there and then because I don't have the tools or I don't have the information to do so. So it's informing that to a different part of the business. It could be a quality, quality assurance um, part of the business who can then start listening into some recordings and looking at surveys or call recordings and listening to surveys to start to determine what is the issue and how can we take ownership for those issues. And it starts really building that ownership. As Michiel said, everybody owns the complaints handling. 
If a customer comes to comes with a complaint, we all by nature have ownership that we should be trying to resolve that to ensure we have a happy customer. So that's one side where I think the supervisor steps in, particularly if, it, if it's advisor control, but even if it's outside of the advisor's um, control, that they work with the quality team to, to ensure the right process and the right steps are being taken to address that issue because unless it's addressed, we're going to continue getting calls that are, are customer complaint inquiries. I do also see that in today's world, there, there, is a, there is a new role around quality assurance where really we should be monitoring all channels that a customer can interact with, interact with the company on. It's not just calls anymore. We're looking at what's going on on email, what's being written in social media. You know, how, are, how is the public or the consumer, how are they complaining? If they've got a complaint, how are they vocalizing that complaint? And that's where quality assurance come in and where they can rank the complaints by, by volume of complaints, hopefully they're not too many, but also by department and, and type of business line so that we can then take that, into, that information and start identifying trends. And, there, and we'll come on to the ways of doing that shortly. But really it's early identification. The sooner we get to, to the bottom of an issue, the, the more quickly we can address it, building in that ownership, and where necessary, driving for some policy and process changes within a business, and being able to do both internal and external communications. So it may be that they need to get a screen pop out to, to a lot of employees to say, listen, we know customers are calling us today because they can't they can't get this information, our website may be down, or we've, there's been a marketing campaign that's gone on, we weren't aware about it, we haven't been able to answer the questions, customers are now getting hugely frustrated and starting to complain, and get that information out so that everyone's got the information there or at their fingertips and they can, they can quickly address. So it's being able to quickly respond to the customer because the quicker we respond, the less likelihood it is that the situation goes viral. Social media today is very powerful, but the one thing I always um, reiterate around, around social media is it's 10% of the communication around your business. 90% is already within the business through recordings and emails and written communication. But you know we, we know that there's that threat around social media. So the tools that we would typically look at is, is understanding from a quality perspective what's going on. We'll come into the other areas around speech, text analytics, as well as desktop analytics to really drive um, the, those processes forward. So if we take a, take a bit of a drill down now into some of the solutions around detecting complaints within a business and how we can be very proactive in our management of it. What you'll see on the screen coming up now is a bit of a spaghetti chart of different areas of where, um, how customers um, can be contacting a business and, and the rather unstructured um, environment that a lot of us work in. I mean, and this, is, you know, this isn't to be disparaging to anyone, but you know, there are so many means of communicating with a business. There's so many different people who believe they have ownership around it, and in different ways they do have ownership. But it's trying to build that unified view and that consistency within the business that sometimes becomes challenging. So emails go into one area, calls go into another area, um, customer feedback surveys go completely somewhere else. And nobody's got that 360 view around the business of what's going on. So where we want to get to, that's the view of Utopia is that, that we're, we're far more unified um, in our approach to this and I, that, that we can get the alignment across the business units so that I can then start seeing around what are some of my operational trends within the business, how is my customer satisfaction and my loyalty, do I have a, a, a group of customers that I would identify as being at-risk customers because they, they've either been quite vocal in their interactions about dissatisfaction um, or potentially more concerning, they're at risk because we don't talk to them. Are they those silent customers that, that really don't like to complain um, and, 
and are just quietly just going, oh, well, I'll, I'll just deal with it, or I'll just go out somewhere else, I won't make a fuss. But we want to understand those interactions that we have to identify, you know, actually, this customer, they may not have vocalized the complaint, but they aren't, actually, aren't terribly satisfied with the service that they're receiving. So we want to get to a place where we can see what's going on from, from a perspective around the voice of the customer. And I look at it in actually in four areas. There are three components on the screen now in front of you around voice of the customer analytics. And these are traditionally the, the three areas that most companies would look at, and that comes under speech, te speech analytics, so listening to the voice, the spoken voice of the customer, text analytics, so the written communications with the customer, and that can be quite unstructured data that we're, we're getting through, as well as, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, feedback from the customer, so enterprise feedback. And around that, that is um, survey information that we may have solicited directly from them. And where we want to get to is that we have this single platform where we can view what's going on around those major touch points within the customer to, to drive that visibility into what's going on. To then really start drilling into the reasons why customers are contacting the business, what are the trends around that, so we start to understand the customer journey within, within the business and, and the language that's being used and the, and, and the reasons for those inquiries. And then we can start personalizing around different parts of the business what's going on. Michiel made a very valid point when he was, he was going through the earlier part of this presentation where he said, everybody owns complaints. So when I think about some of the scorecards and the dashboards that I would set up with, with, with customers, I typically would look about setting up a complaint scorecard. If we all own how we resolve complaints with customers, we probably want to set that up as, as, as a performance management metric that we all work to. And certainly, um, more and more senior execs should also be taking that as part of their bonus plans that they look uh, you know, how are we handling complaints within the business? Um, so that's the one side. So we've got these three areas, and I said there was a fourth area that I very much look at when it comes to complaints handling. And for me, that's understanding what's going on on the desktop of the employee when they're interacting, they're dealing with a customer. How are they interacting? What are the applications that they're going in? Do I want to look and listen to the call and start um, populating the screen with some information? Do I want to guide the employee through their interaction with that customer to ensure that from a compliance perspective, we have handled all the key areas if it's a complaint so we, we can show that we're absolutely squeaky clean on how we've interacted with that customer. So let's drill into this in a wee bit more detail. First areas I would look at when it comes to complaints handling, and I'm really trying to get some insight into my customers, is some transactional survey results. Are they happy? Are they unhappy? You know, what could we have done better? If it's around um, setting expectations, how can we how can we address that? So survey information really gives the customer that opportunity to respond. And I was looking at some data yesterday um, that we've recently run, again, with the CCA and Ipsos Mori that will be coming out with shortly. Um, and it was looking at, a, at how we complain and do, do we actively complain. And what I've seen is a shift from, say, two years ago where people didn't believe that companies actually listened to complaints to see far more of a shift towards com the, the consumer believes that companies are taking complaints more seriously, and that could be because they have to um, from a regulatory perspective, or that you really want to be looking after complaints because you know, it's easier to keep existing customers than to go out and find new customers. So certainly looking at survey results is important, and more and more companies are doing that. Take that to another step further, a step further within the analysis, and, and start in looking at the comments that customers are, are writing be that within within a survey, if they're writing some text within a survey, be that in email communication with you or out there in social media. So really trying to get 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 a grip of the written communication that's going on 
between, um, between the consumer and the company. And then taking the voice of the customer as in their, their spoken communication with you and looking at some of the key trends around the business. Why are, they, why are we, call, why, is a, why is a customer calling? What is it around? Is it around customer satisfaction? Is it because a, a competitor is running a campaign against us? So maybe by the competitor running a campaign, it's triggered a thought within the, within the customer. Moving on around the desktop side, so I love the, com the concept around desktop, what I refer to as desktop and process analytics, because it gives me this insight that I otherwise wouldn't have so I can see the external communication with the customer, but also start seeing what, how are we as a business interacting and dealing with that information? What information are we putting in the systems? What are we looking up when the customer is making a complaint to us? But we can also, from the desktop um, analytics, initiate screen recording. So this is something really, really serious, and we start filling out some information in a certain screen. Um, within, within say, a CRM system, I can initiate that screen recording goes on. So I have that information, which if I'm trying to protect myself from a compliance perspective, I then have the spoken communication with the customer as well as some screen recording to really see in a lot of detail what's going on. I can append desktop information to a recording. So if I've got speech analytics and I want to find a call and then I want to pull up information directly from the desktop, if I'm appending information to it, I've got that capability of doing so. I can also then, um, when, it, when I'm in a, in a re very regulatorized environment, I can also put screen pops up on, on, for the employee and say, you have to give them this information. Do not proceed any further until you've read this so that the customer is totally aware that we're following a clear process here and we know where we stand and we know how to progress with it. So we can set that up within the, within the, pro, within the process of our interactions with the customer. And then finally, listening to some of the speech, if we want, we could also do some real-time notifications to the employee. Now, sometimes I get a wee bit nervous about that because I can do a lot of things at one go, but if I'm starting to see lots of things popping up on the screen, I might get a little bit confused. So my recommendation to customers is always keep that as simple as, as you can because you don't want to distract the employee from their communication with the customer. So drilling, yeah. did you have something to add on that, Michiel? Yeah, just, just one point, Claire. Um, when, when you talk about real-time speech notification, it's not just about um, you know, guiding that employee. It's, it's also about providing an early warning within the organization. So what you could do as well is with that same sort of uh, technology is drive awareness at a high level to the supervisor, to the QA, to the manager by sending an automatic email, popping a message and saying, listen, this customer complained uh, about this point. So just consolidating some key information from a complaint to highlight, you know, specific cases or specific customers complaining. Brilliant, thank you. That's a very valid point. So, let's do a final little bit here then. Um, so, again, understanding that sentiment and the analysis that we can make around customer contacts and, and looking at that within the business. Firstly, I can categorize complaints across all contact mediums within the business. So what you can see here is I'm looking at it from, from different perspectives. I can look at customer complaints. I can look at billing inquiries and maybe start tying um, between the two. I can then start proactively um, auditing those inquiries and those conversations. Um, to address and take action in, in how we're dealing with that. And so what you're seeing here is we're breaking out that conversation with the customer to then be able to set up the alerts, just as Michiel has just said, around the using the desktop analytics to say, to say to employee, you know, your supervisor's on the way. You know, you may want to make an offer whilst the supervisor's coming along to say, you know, the supervisor's on his way. Um, going to help you with this inquiry. So it goes back to where I started within this presentation about the role of the supervisor is so critical in, in driving um, the communication and driving that support and mentoring for their teams. So we're using that technology to help along the way. 
Um, then looking at, at other areas where, you know, in a lot of instances where the customer, uh, customers give us formal information, but there are also quite a lot of instances where the customer um, is, may just be having a conversation with us but isn't formally um, complaining. But we still want to identify if there's a customer who is showing signs of being frustrated or dissatisfied but may not have complained as such. I remember looking at, at, at research that, that we did I think about a year or so ago and we were looking in the UK and I was running a comparison just because I was having to do some travel. I was looking between the UK and, and, and Russia about how we deal with things and you know, in the UK we, we sort of silently suffer um, whereas in Russia, the consumer there was, was typically quite angry and they're very vocal and very quick to complain. And, and I, I think in, in the UK, and it can come down to that stiff upper lip of, you know, I can't possibly make a fuss about this. We we'll just soldier on. But we sometimes we don't actively complain. So we want to take that information and, and, and identify trends that we potentially haven't previously picked up within, within that communication. You know, so that we understand that we can be more proactive in how we interact and deal with that with the customer. Taking that on to being able to do a lot of root cause analysis to be able to visualize you know, what's going on, how are our customers interacting, is it around complaints, is it in a certain area or is it across the board? Because if it's in a certain area, then we must focus on that and, and, and address it. And then start to categorize um, and trend so we can get the right alert set up within the business to to address and, and ensure that we're we're hitting the the, the SLA the service level agreements that, that we have in place within the business so final slide bringing it all together here is then really looking at this from integrating um, the the various areas together so that the so for example a customer enters a complaint online um, and that we can take that through um, feedback management and really understand what's going on we take text analytics to dig into the the, the written communication around a complaint and understand why customers aren't satisfied so that we've got that insight and now it's beholden once we've got the insight it's beholden upon us to really um, drive that forward with the customer and address it and, and communicate back to the customer. The worst thing we could possibly do is have the information and then not act on it because that does annoy people. Um, certainly as a consumer it would irrit it irritates me. Um, and then looking around the recordings and the, the call recordings in the contact center really expose so much information that it, it, to me it's like it's gold getting that information and, and understanding, really understanding what's going on so that we can proactively manage and, and drive um, drive out broken processes within a business and using the desktop analytics to support operational changes. And quite often, you know, if you are making a change within the operation, using desktop process analytics to to guide staff through the new process means that they get, pick it up more quickly because there's this, they, they're, they're being taken step by step through um, the, the, the new process and ensuring compliance to that. So I think there is a lot of um, components that can help with a business who can give that insight and the days of just listening to three calls per employee per month, um, I think those are long gone. Um, because we have so much information that we can drill into and there, you know, there's no way you can listen to every call that goes into your business or, or, or compare every email to see if there's a trend. But technology is out there today to help in, in driving um, that information to the right people, give, putting it on their finger, at their fingertips so that they can really drive um, the right processes within the business. So I think at that point, we're about where we said we would be, John, timing-wise. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions, if that's okay. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant, uh, Claire. And uh, so thank you very much, Claire Richardson and, uh, and Mikhail uh, Laley for uh, a 
really interesting insight into the processes and the technologies around what we call the science of complaints management. So ladies and gentlemen, if you've got any outstanding questions that you haven't yet put through the Q&A system, if you, if you hit that, uh, if you hit that, uh, that question mark icon on the floating toolbar, then your questions will come straight through to us. And I'm just going to uh, swap over the slide decks now. And, uh, and uh, so there we go, just, just to remind you. And uh, we've, got, we've got quite a few questions in, but I'm just going to start off, uh, Claire and, and, and Mikhail, with, uh, with, with a, um, uh, Probably an obvious an obvious question that a lot of people um, ask, and it's certainly one which is uh, which has been popular, is um, is in a regulated environment is there a is there a, a definition of a complaint, um, or is a complaint to one sector different to what is classified as a complaint, and not just a uh, you know a, a customer gripe um, in in another sector? What, is, is there a, is there a, is there a simple answer to that? Not sure there's a simple answer as such, but if somebody formally writes to a company or picks up the phone and and says, you know, I'm very unhappy with the way that you've handled this or I wish to complain, you know, you've got to take that seriously. And certainly, you know, we know that in, in regulated environments, particularly financial services, because there's a a huge amount of focus of, on rebuilding trust with the consumer. Anything that is that is seen as negative, or you know, the fear around even the words "I fear," "I believe," "I've been missold," has yes. to be taken terribly seriously, and because nobody wants to 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 cause any more distress with the consumer. So certainly, if if, an, if a consumer sends an email in to customer relations that yeah. is a complaint, it has to be handled within within a within a fixed period of time. If the consu if the company certainly around a complaint has been able to handle it within 48 hours, mm. certainly the last time I looked at the regulation was within 48 hours. It didn't need to be um, registered um, to the FCA. If it takes more than 48 hours to respond to set in, said inquiry or complaint from the customer, it needs to be registered. And the FCA then publishes um, a, a report or a ranking on which financial services companies have handled complaints the most effectively. Um, nobody wants to be number one on that list because it's number one in the wrong wrong way. So yes. we know from working with our with our customers, there's a huge amount of focus on being able to respond in a very timely fashion, so within 48 hours, to any um, neg to any complaint if it can be dealt with within 48 hours. I, I think in financial services today. Um, it will be to avoid having to go to the FCA. Well, one, one additional point on that, John, if I may, is having worked with a number of financial services organizations around complaints handling, I, anything that comes in as a complaint, and some complaints are as simple as, you know, I can't find the opening hours on your website and you've, you're closing my branch an hour earlier and that is a pain yes. to... You've missold me. You've missold, uh, you know, uh, uh, personal protection. Yes. Um, all those will be will be logged and handled uh, in a similar way through going through the same process. Um, looking at one one of the UK banks, I mean, they have like 150 different complaints types, and <laughs> and you know, yeah, uh, there, there's a big pain. And some of them, like PPI, they they have their own team, their own business unit, the whole floor. Um, but in essence, it's all handled the same way. But as Claire mentioned, the majority of which will be handled within the 48-hour timeline. Well, well, that, well, that's quite interesting, then, isn't it? Because because there's sort of like um, there, there is the potential for for sort of a conflict of interest between between not wanting to have a externally visible high level of complaints versus the organisation wanting wanting the customers to tell them about things that are irritating them, that are negative to their customer experience, um, that are, you know, sort of potentially causing them to go on social media and, 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 and highlight weaknesses in the organization. And, and, and therefore, that sort of, 
that sort of conflict between between wanting to suppress the headline number of complaints in inverted commas versus wanting feedback, whether it's positive or negative, from 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 the customers, that must be quite an issue. I, I would I, I would assume. It it is, and every every organisation takes a different approach as to what role it plays. So some organizations who are more outside in or more customer centric mm. will choose to deal with that response and they feel the customer experience, their perception will come first. Whereas other organizations and, and seemingly the majority um, of uh, across industries um, is still in a zone where you know, this is what I do, and I'll do it as best as I can. And sometimes there's a misalignment, but then, hey, sorry, customer, I delivered what I said I would. Um, so I guess it depends on your operating model. Yeah, no, it's um, and, and and it is therefore possible, I'm assuming, that an organisation could have very high levels of complaints but also very high levels of customer satisfaction because it's an open organization that is encouraging people to, 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 to feedback, even if it's negative, they're actually encouraging people to tell them about negativity and, and they're acting on it and, um, and as a result, those, you know, those, those customers are becoming satisfied because um, you know, I, think, I, think, I think there's some interesting stats floating around that actually you know, if someone complains and you actually recover the situation effectively, you can turn that you know, you can turn that detractor into actually your biggest advocate just by dealing with the complaints um, satisfactorily. So, so it looks to me that you know, sort of, uh, sort of, especially in regulated environments, that uh, you know that there is the potential to conflict. But, but what is what is quite interesting from what you've said in your presentation is is actually reacting to complaints is obviously very important because you have to do that from a you know from a regulatory perspective. But actually. A lot of what you're talking about is is picking up all of those things which may well, all of those negativities that that are happening within conversations over whatever channel, which can be acted on so that they don't materialise into formal complaints later on down the line. Is that a is that an important part of of using analytics? It's not just the it's not just the reactive. Well, let's let's spot the complaints once they've happened. It's also Spotting those sort of little negativities that build up to, to to become complaints a bit later on. Yes, yeah, I'll give you a, a uh, so absolutely on the money. I mean, uh, I worked with a retailer uh, a month ago. They they had a a mistake on their website. They still do, um, and that was driving complaints. But they found it was more costly to, or too costly to change that because it was hard coded in their web design. Then and so they're they're accepting that they will continue to have complaints about the misinformation on the website, um, and and I guess it's it it is it may be a bad example because we're talking about resolving the issues. But what I mean is, we we have more and better tools to understand where where it breaks down, and so we have better visibility of what we need to resolve in order to address any structural problems that are driving complaints. Okay, that's interesting. And um, and um, and in terms of in terms of the UK, in terms of using using the tools which which are available, many of which uh, sort of Berend have uh, have been at the forefront of uh, of, of 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 developing. Uh, have, have you seen a a gradual take up, or or have, in the last year have we seen a particular a particular spike in interest in in you know in trying to solve the com the complaints handling issue. What, what's the take up been like in the UK and uh, perhaps versus other countries? Um, well, we're certainly seeing um, a great increase in in customers listening to to using voice of customer analytics technology to really understanding the reasons for um, customer inquiries, be that complaints or or any other inquiry really. We're seeing a, a, a huge pickup in, in those areas, but also it taking um, the feedback technology um, to to understand you know, the the more structured data from from the customer. I was recently working actually on an opportunity in in Germany, where they were looking both within the contact centre as well as franchise stores 
to take that structured data so they could really understand um, the, the customer's perception of, of every interaction with them any, or every interaction where they surveyed, um, how that, how, whether the customer was satisfied, dissatisfied, and looking at it both from a, the ability to let the customer write um, written text and their feedback, but also just to send them a quick SMS did we resolve your issue? Um, how can we help you further? And, and just very simple as an SMS. And certainly that's an area that I think was becoming increasingly interesting for, for a lot of consumer, a lot of customers because it's a, it gives them that ability to, to interact quite easily and, and drive that information through. So I certainly see it as, as an area of, of interest. It's, it's growing within the market. And, and the consumer is a lot cuter about how they can um, drive um, responses from companies these days than they were previously. Um, so I think more and more companies are, are, are dealing or taking very seriously um, those inquiries from customers. And, and in terms of and in terms of in terms of regulated industries, is uh, in terms of in terms of uh, driving demand for for uh, customer complaint solutions. Uh, is it compliance with regulation, which is the number one driver, or is it underlying customer experience and, and the knock-on effects on the business around churn and, uh, and, and customer advocacy? What do you see as the, as the, sort of the, sort of the, key, the key business benefits and therefore the drivers of taking up this sort of, these sort of solutions? I think it depends on, on the industry. Um, from a regulatory environment, a regulation is driving a lot of behaviour. It's not to say that the companies don't want to get that customer insight and improve customer experience, but regulation is, is such that you, you know, you, you're required to, to make sure that you, you're squeaky clean. Um, but I think in other industries, it, it is absolutely around the customer experience. It's, it's a tough economic environment. You want to keep the customers that you've got and ensure that you're you're addressing their their requirements. So, you know, if you can deal with deal with those inquiries and provide your customers with the best customer experience possible, um, as well as be competitive in, in in your pricing with those customers, then 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 you have more chance of keeping them. You know, everybody's com is, is a lot of companies are, are concerned about the ability to churn, and and in certain industries you see a lot of churn. But that's just an industry factor. You, know, you look at the insurance sector, consumers are still going to churn. You, know, you get your home insurance um, renewal come through. Probably most people, I think, these days will go out and whether even if they've had a great service, they're still going to go and have a look and see if they can get better deals somewhere else. Whereas um, in other industries, there's, there's far less churn. You know, banking, you know, there isn't, whilst there are opportunities, and I know the government is encouraging people to churn. There isn't a huge amount of churn in banking, but there's a lot of regulation about how you deal with the consumer. So you know, in the insurance sector, we could be doing, they could be doing an amazing job and really dealing with those inquiries very effectively and giving a great experience. But the sector being what it is, you know, consumers are, are, are going to go for where they can get the best deal. But you want to be able to be giving that service so that if you're, if you're pricing it, if your insurance is competitive, you, you, the consumer's going to stick with you because they've had a great service. Right, we've got a question in from, um, from, from a, a delegate from BT, and this is, and, and, and this is with regard to the, the, the screen pops on the, on, on the agent's desktop. The delegate asks, um, how are those screen pops generated? Is it built into the desktop system, i.e. part of the process, or is the pop being generated based on what is being actually said in the call itself? Yeah, so um, that, that's a good question. I guess the, the short answer is uh, yes to both uh, parts, but the, the more straightforward uh, usage uh, of this is you by, by leveraging desktop activity. So based on the, the activity of an employee on their desktop or the absence of it, so imagine uh, a value that they put in or um, the fact that they skip a certain step in the process, all those kind of things could be valid triggers that, that push a, a message or a question to the, uh, to the employee in question in real time. 
Um, we also see the leveraging or combining sort of speech analytics with that desktop uh, analytics, uh, with the, the two components binding them together. So you trigger voice. Um, but I mean, as as uh, some of you may know, I mean, speech analytics is not at a point where there's 100% accuracy on, on what is being captured. And so that is typically more being used in a sales, like a cross-selling and upselling type of context. If you look at a compliance context, there's more validity or more uh, accuracy in leveraging desktop activity where possible. And, uh, and I've got another technology question, so it might, uh, Mikhail, it might, it might be again one for you, um, which is regarding um, the use of voice analytics, and this, uh, this is a delegate from, from 3UK. Um, so with, with, with regard to the use of voice analytics to produce stats on, on the types of issues, etc., uh, what is the key benefit um, of uh, voice analytics over traditional call tagging approach within CRM systems? Um. Okay, so I, I think there might be this. This is uh, a, a, we could answer this in many different ways. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Clara might might also add to this. But, but my thoughts. I think a, an important point, in case it didn't come across earlier, with uh, one of the points uh, Claire raised, is that what speech analytics can do is it can raise issues that you haven't mapped, that you're unaware of, and it's all about creating more awareness, right? I mean, if you look at complaint handling, um, it's it's easy or it's easier to deal with those complaints you're well aware of. Uh, you know, there, there are some business drivers or call drivers that you're well aware of, um, but it's those those new ones, those nuggets that come up because of a marketing campaign from one of your competitors, or because of an issue with a new product or a new service you've released, and you want instant visibility of those as soon as possible. So that is an important driver, and that's what speech analytics brings to the table, I think, in early identifying sort of issues and, and complaints and, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, issues around complaints being raised. Um, one thing around call tagging, I mean, call tagging is, is not something that necessarily operates independently from that speech analytics, because what call tagging can do is it can add categories, it can add another dimension to to the call categories that speech analytics would capture. So if you imagine the 150 call uh, complaint types that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, call tagging could use, could, could add information about the call types and the, 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 some of the uh, uh, account or, or um, uh, caller background to the call so that when you do analytics on those calls, it helps you add dimensions to that analytics, create additional buckets, create additional categories. Just, okay. one, just, just one final question for you both is, um, is uh, in terms of in terms of the clients that you're working with, what sort of volumes? And obviously, you know, we're not looking for exact figures, but what you know, are, are these are these organisations that are getting large volumes of complaints, and therefore and therefore these solutions, you know, um, are. Are, are particularly effective, or 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 do organisations that have you know sort of varying levels of uh, of, of complaints within their systems uh, also benefit from from uh, from 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 the solutions that you've described today? Um, I think it can be applied across um, across businesses. Um, certainly, it doesn't just need to be large enterprises. Everybody deals with anybody that's dealing with consumers and customers and is, is focused on customer service and, and customer satisfaction um, has has a complaints handling division um, so uh, it's certainly something that is is apply applicable across across sizes of business um, I think the the key is to to have a clear understanding of what you're driving to achieve as, as a as a business what is what is your objective here, and and how how do you want to interact with with your with your with your customers? Certainly, from our perspective, we we've deployed this kind of technology within one division of of a business because that's the only area that was really was 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 focusing on it and needed to drive drive change within the business. And then from there, they've expanded out across the business. Um, so it, it isn't it. it one size, unfortunately, it doesn't fit all. 
probably a good thing because it means that we've got there are a lot of ways of of applying this technology within the business. But certainly, with with the with the pro projects that my team are working on um, with Inverent, it goes from being you know relatively um, small, I call SME businesses, to 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 large big financial services, and it it's really. The key to me is, is understanding what are the corporate objectives and how do we align with those. Excellent. I think that's a great point uh, to, to end our webinar on today. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, to you, Claire Richardson and, uh, and Michael Laley, for your insight and your sharing uh, today. That's, uh, that's very much appreciated from myself. I've learned an awful lot about the, about the science of complaints management today, and I hope you, ladies and gentlemen, have likewise. Uh, we, we didn't have time to address all of the questions, and, um, and, and there has been a few clarifications with regard to the, to the, um, the FCA timings with, with regard to complaint management, so we, we, do, we do encourage you to visit the FCA website for exact definitions on that. So thank you very much to Claire and Mikhail. Um, thank you uh, very much, Varian, for your, for your continued support of the Directors Club. Um, we can't bring these knowledge share events uh, to the audience without your, your, your uh, continued support. Um, so visit Verint at verint.com if you want any more information on the voice analytics, workforce optimization solutions that we've talked about today. If you want to uh, see what other events are being held by the Directors Club, visit our website at dcgbni.co.uk. And as I said earlier, follow us at Twitter, uh, at our, on our Twitter address, which is at dcgbni, for lots of the latest um, feature articles and research for the customer professions. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for spending your lunch hour with us. I, I hope that, uh, that I'll have your company again very soon for another Directors Club webinar. And if you look on our website and see our live events, well, I may well um, see you in person at one of those later in the year or in 2014. The recording link um, will be forwarded to you tomorrow as part of our our follow-up on today's, uh, on, on today's uh, live event. If you're listening to the recording of this event, thank you very much as well for spending the time um, to listen and to watch this webinar. Have a very good afternoon to you all, and uh, I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you.